How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. <laughs> I, I, that's that's got to be a record. You okay? You all right well, there? I had the yeah. I'm having heart palpitations. I might need a doctor. Actually, I I well, lost good thing. oxygen. I Man, I'm here. I'm here. Um, but I was, was in front of the um, the brand new Berkeley grad. I wanted to give it a little more bravado, if you will, Doctor Joe. You know what I'm saying? Becca Strand is here. Berkeley graduate. She has double degrees in performance with tuba, uh, film scoring, and a minor in conducting. Hello, Becca. Hello. That's exciting. Um, yeah. It's kind of a weird time to ask a question, Dr. But... Joe. How did you graduate in the pandemic? How Me? did they do it? How did they do the commencement? Yeah, the thing is with Berkeley is um, one of our main aspects of commencement is the commencement concert where students perform for our honorary doctorates who this year we had um like john legend sheila e a whole bunch of people um and that didn't get to happen in person and this year they pre-recorded everything and it was not different just because of the pre-recording but actually the um honorary doctorates got to perform with the students virtually so John Legend was there singing with <laughs> a bunch of my classmates, which was really, really cool. Um, really and then cool. The next day we had actual commencement and that was a pre-recorded video. Um, and I just kind of walked across my living room. <laughs> when, That's cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she did. She walked across the living room. We have it all on tape. How was it, Dr. Joe? How did they, how was the production that they put on for these guys? Well, I, the production was, was incredibly impressive. I mean, to have these world-class performers there who, you know, every year Berkeley has these amazing, amazing people that they give honorary doctorates to. And I don't, Becca, they don't usually always perform, right? They, they just come up, they say a few words. Usually they're not allowed to perform due to contract issues and whatever. So um, they never perform with the students. They usually just come up after the show and are, you know, they might dance or have fun, but they never actually sing or perform with the students. Because of contracts. Also, I mean, not just, it could be all sorts of things, but like a lot of times it's, it usually comes down to legal reasons why they can't perform with us suppose they don't all own the rights to their own songs yeah some of that probably also just like outside of um scheduled tours and things like that with their agencies etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's too complicated um but since this was virtual and they weren't technically performing live they were able to perform which is cool just another bonus coming out of this dr <laughs> joe you know we were talking about that last year i mean last week with the the folks from the repertoire and saying like look at the look at what's positive for theater that's coming out of this right now we're giving it exposure to folks that can't possibly afford or get to the set location for this presentation and now we're able to to share it and here's yet another example where these performers otherwise were contractually bound not to participate and here they are participating how amazing is that it is amazing and they were they were so into it you could just see becca who's the woman who was playing the drums that was julie e amazing and then but John look at that from the perspective of the of the newness to it right just another thing that just breaks down the barriers and now we're moving forward in a different way just like last week we were talking about that I know. back it's like it's now 
are those things going to be in the contracts or can I play at a graduation if I want to now, you know, <laughs> right. because I want to honor these Berkeley folks, you know, technology is wonderful. So this is it. Adaptation is innovation. And here we are. So, so Dan Hassan is coming on as well to chat about a um, music festival that needed to be canceled and all sorts of other things that are going on in, in regard to Corona. Um, but to get back to, to the graduation of Berkeley, um, it was, it was inspiring to see how these kids and these performers rallied to make something really magic happen. Um, probably with not much lead time, um, but there was dancing and there was music and there were other musicians and you could see the instruments and the singers because Berkeley has merged. This is the first year they merged with the Boston Conservatory and, uh, and everyone was doing it. It was amazing. So we've got Dan Hassett. I also love the adaptation. Oh, I'm here. There he is. Well, there he is. In just a moment, I'm going to be into the range for the real video. I actually was, believe it or not, uh, I had an amazing performance ready, but the uh, internet connectivity was struggling out on Couch Beach. I was playing oh, with the band. I was, I was actually, I was with the band. I was with the band on Couch Beach, but uh, we were struggling. So uh, uh, we're here now, live, at least with audio, in, in a moment with video as well. That's great. And of course, you know that's Becca's band is Couch Beach, and um, so. Yes, innovation, that's what we're doing right now. And I don't know where folks may be listening to this, but we're broadcasting out of Massachusetts and a lot is happening this week. Um, the governor of Massachusetts has now moved us with an amazing team of people from stay at home to safer at home is the new phrase. And it is a slow transition back into the workforce and it has to be slow because there's still so much potential for going backwards and a lot of people getting sick again. So it is, um, it is a remarkable time to be alive and to be working together and to be really coming together as a group to get this done. And here's, here's an example of it right here. We have, you know, in studio, Ben, who is there in a distant location. Everybody here is in a distant location. Um, and yet we are bringing you the Dr. Joe show, who we are and why we do what we do. And the reason we do this is because we really believe that everybody wants the same thing, which is to feel valuable. And this is an opportunity for us to share that. And that really is what was happening at the Berkeley graduation. If you could just see how important it was to the school to be able to honor their graduates. Uh, they did it in a creative way. There was no question that there was a sadness to it. Um, but for me personally, as the father of one of the graduates, it was a fascinating advantage because normally Becca, the graduate, is sitting a distant part of the auditorium but here she was right on the couch just hanging out and we were all hanging out together and just take things a little slower it was really a fascinating experience but not without its sadness you know let's be honest it was an i am but it was sad wouldn't you say becca yeah there are definitely parts that i missed out on um but the school's also done a great job of trying to uh, make up for that. Um, like my, the film scoring department did an event where we all got to hang out last night with the professors and stuff. Cause usually after graduation, there's the reception and you all get to go say goodbye to your teachers and whatever. But, um, instead we did that over zoom. Um, and Berkeley is planning on doing separate receptions for each division in the fall. As of right now, I'm not sure if that'll still happen, but it's gonna be really hard for people to be able to get out there and stuff. So it's nice being able to do things over over Zoom. How do you find Zoom as a musician? Is it is it hard to play with? I mean, we had Josh uh, and Tristan talking about that, right? 
uh, Dr. Joe, That's about right. trying to teach a lesson and, and be uh, in sync with the person through Zoom. How have you guys found that as, as you know, real musicians? Yeah, it can be, uh, it's definitely tough as performers. Um, a lot of things that we've been doing are separately tracked and then pre-recorded and then kind of slapped on to something because yeah, there's a lot of sync issues um, right. doing it live. However, there are some cool things as a film composer that I am able to do that I'm not usually able to do with professors or clients where I can show them my audio workspace and I can show them exactly what I'm doing and I can route my audio from my audio workspace into Zoom and they can hear what I'm playing and see what I'm doing. And that's really cool because um, it's hard, it's really hard to do that on a computer that doesn't have all your sample libraries or the program and you can't open anything and it's just a huge mess. So that's that's been cool to collaborate with people with that. Cool. As a matter of fact, if, if you know, at some point, if you guys want to see actually how this happens with Becca's setup, what 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 she did for us um, for her, sort of her graduation party, which was a virtual party with people coming in and listening to the music from literally from all over the world. We had Christopher Sarson uh, calling in from New Zealand. Um, we had people from California. We have people from all over the world able to come in. And that certainly is one of the unforeseen advantages of this, uh, that it's a lot easier for us to socialize. But as with the technology, Becca was able to share her screen and basically show us a little bit about how she actually puts together a film score. Cool. Uh, and it was really quite fascinating. And, and you know, uh, we're on WATD, and so our, our audio listeners wouldn't be able to see it, but we are also live on Facebook. And so if you guys go to Facebook at some point later on, you would be able to see that if, if we decide to. Tap. Speaking of which, Johnny Busher says, hi, Joe. Hey, I'm Johnny. <laughs> Old high school friend. Oh, okay. So, Dr. Joe, amazing. California that you talk about the ability to make it easier to socialize, right? So people are, you know, having this, their own various struggles with this and, and, you know, everyone's dealing with it very differently, but there are a lot of positives coming from this. And we talked about it on one of the, when we had the doctor on grief too, right? Where, how do we mourn? How are we going to mourn these people? And, and your point, when you brought up talking about, you know, someone like Christopher Sarson, who's not going to fly, all the way over here for a wake and a funeral for every single person that he knows. But if they stream it, he can be part of it. Right. And I think we're going to see that with weddings. Now, even with the small gatherings, I've been talking to one of my team members who was, who is scheduled to get married um, in like two or three weeks. And, you know, this happens. So, they're talking about what to do. Do they move it? Do they do a, uh, a smaller type of family only? And if so, is it still going to be 10 people? Are there going to be hotels open? So there's a lot of different things. But, you know, talking about potentially doing a, you know, a streaming wedding where everyone could be a part of it and they don't have to feel pressured on flying in or staying in a hotel or what have you. And if it's produced really well, I mean, you could do the, the the first dance and you could do the toast and you could zoom in right on that person and instead of you know trying to figure out who you can invite you know and limiting your numbers and who's going to come you invite everybody you know and they all have an opportunity to participate in that special day right and you can i mean we did something similar for for carol's birthday uh which was you know right at the beginning of this um and I, I just bought pizza for everybody from all over, wherever they were. And they had cool. pizza delivered to their homes so we could cool. all have a pizza party um, for her birthday. I, I think it probably would save a lot of money on catering uh, in terms of weddings. So, Becca, this is something, you know, down the road, if you want to consider it, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about that, though, right? Another, another positive, right? So... You, maybe you want a big wedding, maybe you want a small wedding. You just, you're able to now have a hybrid, have a small wedding of 20 people on a private location for relatively 
affordable cost, but yet you're still celebrating it with, mm. you know, 200, 300, 400,000 if you wanted to, right? There's the trade off, though. Think of the caterers, think of the DJ, think of the wedding videographer. Mm -hmm. Are they still going to be involved? Right. Are they still going to? I mean, I'm sure that they're, they're, they must be hurting. They must be hurting. Again, right? Adaptation is innovation. innovation. Innovation is adaptation. Which one was it? I already forgot. Adaptation is innovation. But it actually works both ways, isn't it? Danny, you there? So, you know, it's funny because I, I, I didn't realize that I was muted. So I was like, oh, you got to check the chat. Setting. Check the chat, brother. <laughs> I was, Were you I was participating in the conversation? <laughs> Un, yeah, like unbeknownst to anyone but myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear what you had to say about yeah. it. That would be, I love your insight on it. Well, what I was excited about was that I, I, so I didn't get to see the Berkeley graduation, but I heard about it. And what I was going to chime in on the positive, for example, was that I heard, and Becca, you can validate this rumor. I heard that, uh, or invalidate it. I heard that uh, John Legend was like a guest uh, speaker for the uh, Berkeley graduation. And that, that may not have been able to happen in ordinary times, but it actually was able to happen in these times. Yeah, no, that true? he wasn't a speaker, but he, he sang with the students. I mean, there was an arrangement and every, like, it's just so cool having like colleagues of mine being like, oh yeah, I sang with John Legend, you know, <laughs> like it's so cool. Yeah, I think that, in a weird way, that's like a, you know, I, obviously it's not ideal, but that's a cool thing that, you know, who knows if he could have actually been president, uh, president in Boston otherwise, you know. And, and certainly to be singing with graduate students, you know, I think it it was a real gift that he that he did that. Plus, like I said, he was wearing the Berkeley robes. And so it just it was just such a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, and you know that he was he was probably in his house, right? He was in his house. Yes, yeah. And his the other performers the were in their house. And what was cool was um, the Boston Conservatory also has this remarkable uh, dance component to it. And so there were these dancers dancing in sync, but one was was oh. obviously outside her house in California or somewhere by a swimming pool, and somebody else was was in their home dancing. Um, and and then you could, you know, they cut into the musicians and you, and you saw the musicians playing. It was it was really something special and as you know, if you think about when you when you're in a movie or you're watching TV, you you get to see the close-ups, and even that is something unique to this Zoom thing because you don't really see that. If you're in a theater, um, sometimes you're not in the front row; uh, you you're sometimes up way in the balcony. But here you get to see their faces. That was the other thing. Um, my my other daughter Sophie. Uh, turned us on to the Metropolitan Opera, and there was a, a benefit that the Met was doing. And that was the first time I'd ever seen a conductor from the face, you know, watching the way they they sort of motivated and, and brought the orchestra together. It was, it was amazing. So, Dan, I, I, I just want to, first of all, say how grateful I am that you're here, but also, you know, for, for those who don't know, Dan has put together the, the Levitate Music Festival. I think it was last year its 10th anniversary? Eight, eight. Eight, eight? okay. Um, but, yep. but the part that's amazing is that it is, it is such a remarkable thing where, where thousands of people come together, amazing musicians come together, and yet this year, Dan, I think, you know, canceled it but I, but I just want to say how grateful I am that you did that because it saved so many lives. I mean, to have a crowd of people in one area could have, could have been deadly. So what, oh. what, what, what was, what, what's the experience like for you, Dan? I mean, you put all this energy into it. You and Sarah, you know, your, your sister-in-law who, who organized it. What is this experience like for you? I guess it's, it was surreal, you know, like, you know, the whole experience of Levitate producing this Levitate Music Festival um, has been surreal since its, its inception, really. Um, you know, the, the first event was so small, and I look back at the photos of it, and, um, 
you know, relatively to now, <clears throat> excuse me, it was very small. But um, it seems, you know, at the time it seemed enormous. And then, you know, as we go, as time passes, all these things seem to be to be bigger and bigger as we went from one day to two day to three day and thousands of people and then tens of thousands of people. And it was very, very, uh, and is very, very exciting to be a part of. Um, and it is, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like I never would have expected it to get where it was. And I absolutely never would have fathomed the possibility of canceling or postponing it due to a global pandemic. Um, so it was kind of a, um, I say this about all those things that are way more serious than it sounds, but I, I call them like the big boy decisions. And, um, I just, I guess when something like that happened, we, you know, it turns out there's no there was no chance we were going to hold that event. But when we actually postponed it at the time, it, it felt like there was a chance. But I felt like ultimately we wanted to be on the right side of history as a as a company, as Levitate, and as individually, and, and be proud of what we do. And we felt like if, if you, you know, it was hard to get a clear picture on what was going to happen over the next in coming weeks or months or years. But I felt like if we if we tried to power through and hold the large event. Um, and there was a risk of people being injured or even, you know, being exposed to a, a disease at it that we, we had to do the right thing and, and postpone it or cancel it. And uh, so that was the path we chose to take. Um, we were extremely fortunate that we were able to get our, our most of the artists and the headliners to work with us and postpone for 12, 12 full months. Uh, originally, the thought was, Everyone, everybody, including myself at the time, wanted to postpone until Memorial Day weekend, or Labor Day weekend, excuse me. And uh, I'm glad we didn't do that, because I, don't, I think that would have been in vain. And uh, so, you know, ultimately, I, I coming out of it here as an individual, I feel happy that I feel like we made the right decision, um, which is good, because, I, you know, I, I definitely know many festivals and concerts and large events that probably made the wrong decision in trying to hold it and or trying to postpone it to the fall. And uh, that's just not going to happen. I mean, it's, everyone wants to feel safe, and I don't think the, the feeling of safety and security is going to return for, you know, until next year, really. 18 months, didn't you say that, Joe? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I mean, we're, we're all, this is, this is uh, new territory for all of us, and every day we're learning something. Um, but every day we are, I think we're surviving. I mean, I know we're surviving this, but the sacrifices that are being made are, are just, I think that they, they're mind blowing, but they're also, I think, ennoble, you know, they, there's something that ennoble us because we're willing to do this and we know we have to do it. We have a responsibility. And, and Dan has always been about community always and here's another example of it but in a way that we never ever would have imagined tom i'm sorry i cut you off what were you going to say yeah because this is the first i think isn't this one of the first times we've had enough forewarning that like we're aware of the risk like because i remember people talk about how woodstock the first woodstock was held during the time of a it was the hong kong virus in the 60s and it's like who knows how many tens of thousands died because those events were being held still yeah. I don't know whether we had enough advance warning, but we've had enough to cancel things like that. I mean, look, there's there's no professional sports going. Red Sox aren't playing at all. Um, there's a lot, a lot going on. Dan, I, let me ask you, you also have a store. What's going on with your store? Uh, so the retail store, um, you know, I thought would have been kind of, dead in the water there without having the stores open but we've we've been successful in um kind of pivoting to e-commerce which is a possibility these days and for for many companies these days that's all they do they don't they don't participate in brick and mortar commerce at all um so for us we, it was we're not particularly good at it per se um but we, it was kind of sink or swim, and uh, there was, a, you know, there's jobs on the line. So we kind of sat down as a team on the on the side of the company that works on the retail and said, hey, like if we're gonna make this work, we have to find a way to, you know, transition to online. And we've actually been uh, extremely successful in that. We're believe it or not, we're I almost feel um, guilty saying it, 
but we're literally doing better online than we did with the source. And uh, I kind of accredit that to our the crew being extremely creative, and also I accredit it to the fact that it's the only way you can job right now. Yeah. Well, that's really good to hear. Just how do people access your online store? What, is, what where, where do they go? Uh, it's just levitatebrand.com. And uh, it's been fun. You know, with the downtime, we've been able to focus on kind of some new product. And we've been working with a lot of local uh, artists. And, you know, we've been working with a lot of folks that are uh, currently unemployed that are willing to, uh, you know, get down to work and make new products. A lot of like, we've been sewing an amazing amount. We typically don't sew. We hire factories to sew and oftentimes overseas. But right now, the people are home and they want to sew and make creative things. We've been selling these creative things on our website. It's been doing very, very well. Almost better than what we did previously, which is pretty, pretty phenomenal. Again, adaptation is innovation, right? I mean, and, and being able to put the people to work who are at home, giving them something to do, give them a focus, that, that is an amazing contribution to the community. So I, I wasn't aware of that either. Yeah, that's a fantastic model. No, it, it, I honestly, I, I love it. It's it, it's really cool. It's it, it turned into like local and regional manufacturing, and we're basically saying, hey, what what could we make that would be cool, that would be fun for people, that's affordable at any time. And uh, you know, I thought it. I, you know, initially, I thought it might be a way to keep some keep people employed and keep things busy, but it, it seems to actually be working. It's really working. I think it's great, and I, and I hope that it's a model that that other groups can can access and, and do it. I mean, Mark has also, you know, been really creative in the way he's managing his law firm. Well, can I, can I say a little something about Dan and the adaptation innovation? Um, yeah, safety was first, right? As, as you want to be a, a, a socially responsible business owner, safety's first. And we've been scrambling, you know, looking to get something that doesn't look medical, right? So if we're going to approach a consumer, with a mask on, which we were doing, I was I, I I I didn't feel like the medical thing was was working after three weeks, right? Of four weeks of doing it, we're like we there's got to be people out there that are creating fashionable, uh, you know, masks because this is going to be here for a while. You heard Dan. I mean, we're not going to concerts until next summer. I I truly believe that, but. You know, we need to make it so that people are comfortable. We've talked about the masks so many times, Dr. Joe, and I'd love to kind of reiterate what you say about them. But, um, you know, and we were looking and lo and behold, somebody walks up to my uh, outdoor office and I'm like, where did you get that? And he's like, my wife got them online. Levitate. Right here. <laughs> Levitate <That's> brand <laughs> jumped out right in front and said, hey, folks, we're going to be doing this a while. Let's at least, you know, be cool, right? So, Dan, thank you guys again for being so innovative and getting out in front and allowing us to have some fashionable uh, masks, you know? And I think that's going to be a big industry going forward here. Oh, yeah. I mean, the mask, initially, I have to admit, it wasn't any stroke of genius. We just, we had a bunch of shirts and we said, let's cut them up and we'll make masks. And, and that's what people need right now. But uh, it turned out to be really, you know, that that mask we make, you know, it's it's a, it's a print called the Cantina print that's been like kind of in Levitate's line forever. And we had all these shirts that had just arrived. And we said, you know, I, we can't imagine everyone's going to need a shirt, but we'll we'll cut them up into pieces. And and we hired, you know, initially just one woman to make the shirts, and then we put them online. They sold out. And then, you know, at this point, we have five or six people selling these masks every day, and it's a good thing because like, we pay them per piece, and you know, they can they can make money and. 20% of the, um, uh, the proceeds we just donate to like, uh, first, you know, first responders. And, uh, it's, I thought it was something that would just be kind of a, you know, having it for a couple of days, but I'm starting to realize that we're going to be selling masks for the rest of the year, if not longer. You know? Oh yeah. And people are going to want to go to the beach and they're going to want to look fashionable and how else do you look fashionable, but wear levitate brands, right? <laughs> I'm still getting used to wearing masks, but it's definitely it's definitely for the uh, greater good, and people are getting used to it really quickly. So, Dr. Joe, why should we wear masks? So, we wear a mask to protect other people. Um, 
you know, 25 to 50 percent of people have no symptoms who are carrying COVID. Uh, and so when we wear a mask, what we're basically sending uh, is a message that we value each other. Um, what's really fascinating is that we use facial recognition to try to understand what somebody else is thinking or feeling. And the mask has traditionally covered that to hide a person's identity. And so the mask is very often associated with something dark and sinister. But in this case, it is completely the opposite. It is associated with caring what other people are doing and wanting to protect them. So please wear the mask. You know, we, we, we really have some idea of how we can manage Corona. The social distancing, which is not the same as emotional distancing, but keeping yourself a little bit apart because we know that the Corona is airborne and that's part of why we wear the mask as well is that it stops your breathing from infecting somebody else. We have another guest who may be coming on, another member of Couch Beach, Jacob, who is the drummer. Now, the, the other reason why I wanted I wanted Couch Beach here was because what what is it like from the performer's point of view? You know, we're talking about Dan as, as the producer of this huge festival, but what is it like for the performers as well to have to put everything on hold? Um, and so at some point, you know, really want to touch on that with, with Becca and, and Jacob. So that's part of what's going on in this, these crazy days of Corona is so many people are having to adapt. One of the things that we're also seeing in, in my practice here um, is this sense of repetitiveness and people losing track of time and what day is it? I don't know if anybody else has been experiencing that, but for some folks, it's like, it just seems relentless. Yeah, and it's terrifying. It's over and over the same thing, like like Groundhog Day. Has anybody else been experiencing that, that, that you're sort of losing track of time? Yes. No. It's. Did it's, I say that out loud? You did say it out loud, but you said it <laughs> again. What day is it? Exactly. I mean, this this actually, this is one of the ways that I know what day it is, because we do our shows on Thursday. So that sort of orients me to the entire week. Right. Um, Jacob, are you there? Welcome, Jacob. Let me introduce you to everyone. You know me and you know Becca. Um, Mark Stiles and Tom McCoy are my co-hosts. And Hello. Dan Hastert, um, you may or may not know of, Dan is the guy who puts together the Levitate Festival, but also was going to play at, you guys were going to play it at his uh, restaurant. Hey, it might still happen. Right? Yeah, I hope so. So, Mike. Jacob, welcome. So we're talking about all the sacrifices that have happened and being put on hold, but you have, you know, uh, part of your career is performance. Um, what, what has this been like for you having to put all of that on hold? He's on hold. All right. Yeah, your inputs, something's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Inputs. So this is let's so that see. bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's speechless. It's Don't forget guys, well, there is a difference it. between artistry and tech. Tech crew is very important. Don't forget. <laughs> Always blame your tools. And that is our producer, Ben Nipotent, in studio at WATD. <laughs> Caution, the sound engineer does not need to be fed. No, I still can't hear you. So, Dan, Rexicana, we can space those tables six feet apart, can't we, and have a good time? Uh, yeah, we can totally do it. I, I'm waiting for the moment. I think we'll be open, and I think we'll still do all the shows just in a new good. format. Cool. I love we'll hearing continue. that. There'll still be shows. People want to come. We can space the tables out. Yep. Especially and we can have and we have masks for sale if you're not feeling comfortable, right? That's right. Wear a mask and space out the tables. You got to come with the group that you are comfortable being with. I think that's important. People Agreed. you've been with anyway, yeah, like family and roommates. Right. Whoever you're with already, like you know, whoever you're already exposed to. Right. What are they saying uh, about live entertainment? Well, I don't think they're really saying anything. Uh, I think that uh, the reality is that gathering in large groups is what, you know, 
it's right. all about. I think just as much about you know a concert is about the performance and the entertainment and the and the in the music and the art of it, but it's also about being with your friends at it, the social aspect. Right. And we just can't do the social aspect right now. It just it just is what it is what it is. Um, but I do think you know in certain formats, you know, if you have a, a outdoor space with a bunch of tables and and live music, that's a format that people like. It might be for a different kind of music, maybe not for a full rock concert with a full band. It might not be appropriate, but for certain groups, that's actually how you want to see them play anyway. So I think right. those groups are going to be, you know, back to uh, back to performing a lot quicker. So kind of like the the Sunday brunch vibe that you had going on. Exactly. So what, what we're doing is, or about to do, as soon as we know the date, we can actually do it. Is we'll we'll call back all the bands and say, hey, can we? Do you want to play? You know, solo or maybe a duo when you're spaced six feet apart, you bring your own microphone, microphone, it's all set up. And I think that'll be happening a lot quicker than anybody thinks. You know, I don't think that entertainment is over for 18 months. That's not going to happen. People are going to go out, they're going to eat, they're going to want entertainment, and including music. And do you think, are there going to be any protocols that, that establishments have to put in place other than just distancing? I can't say for sure, but I would imagine, like, for us, we're transitioning more to, like, the staffing will be different. Like we'll have a staff that's wiping down the tables, doing the bathrooms way more frequently, you know, every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, uh, you know, waiting in line for a bathroom will be a little bit different. You know, it'll be spaced out just like when you go to CVS right now, it's every six feet. Um, but I think, you know, all these things in place are going to dramatically slow the spread of the virus. Um, you know, if nothing else, even if we just were all six feet apart, it'd be a dramatic difference than before we went into quarantine. That's right. And that, that really is what we're asking people to do in general. What we're, what we're working on at Riverside Community Care is the slow reintegration and opening of, of you know, some of our day programs. Um, and we are being so thoughtful about how we're going to do that. There is, we're not rushing into anything. Because the whole idea is you want to, if you've got a building, you want to keep the virus out of your building, period. But if the virus gets in, what you want to do is make the least hospitable environment for that virus. So, you know, sanitizers, you know, what about shoes? And there's just so many things that we're beginning to think about and consider. But it is remarkable um, how much we're learning. Um, I mean, here, here's, here's something that is a real question. That I, I'm not sure everybody knows the answer to yet. What about air conditioning and ventilation in a room? Do we have it? Do we not have it? Because we know that the virus travels. We wear a mask so that we don't have the virus traveling through the air. But if you now have an air conditioner or a fan, is that virus now moving f further from one place to another? Can it, is it more than six weeks? We don't know that. There was a, a paper came out um, of a group in China where they happened to have a restaurant, and it's not just confined to China. The, the restaurant, air conditioning, other people got sick. They were trying to do their best. We're not sure what to do <clears throat> with just the ventilation in the room. Just think about that. It's something that we just take for granted, and now we have to think about what to do. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, you know? But if you're outdoors, it's going to be easier and and which your is why i think is I think, which is why i think dan is set up to kind of lead us through this that's in, right in the hospitality space there's a couple of you know venues uh, that i've been thinking about that can really launch us in the right direction and knowing the you know the leadership and the ownership and he's talked about protocols he's already put them in place right but his actual venue is perfect to say, hey folks, we can do this. Even if you don't feel safe, you're gonna feel safe here because yeah. you're outdoors, right, Dan? Yeah. I think so. And I, you know, I, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I think that in general society is gonna divide down a line and people are gonna decide uh -huh. that they're living their lives and they're not. Um, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I do think that's happening, active, actively happening. And you can't, you know, yeah, I think people with certain conditions, you know, people that really, really, really adamantly, no matter what, do not want to get this virus, 
won't show up at our, our restaurant or establishment, regardless of whether it's outside or inside right. or, or what. But, you know, generally we are an outdoor event, uh, outdoor space and outdoor venue. And we, we probably, we think are safer than let's say an indoor space with ventilation and, and, and some other unknowns, but could you still catch it outdoors? I'm sure you can. Um, but I do think that there's going to be a, a, peop, a, a subset of people that say, Hey, I'm willing to take certain chances because I'm not going to be in isolation for six months, 12 months, 24 months, because there's certainly no guarantee of a vaccine anytime soon. Um, so I think that, you know, I do think that, and I think that's good. I think, I think people personally, I think people deciding to get back out there safe with safety measures in place is, is the right move. And, you know, being six feet apart, social, social distancing, distancing, just that and wiping down the tables more often. I mean, I think it's going to dramatically slow the spread of this. And I think it's happening act already actively. And as much as people don't want to say it, I think people are already out there going for walks together and keeping distance. And people are, are getting back together already in a safer yeah. way. In a safer way. And that and that's why, you know, the, the new phase of Massachusetts is safer at home, not stay at home. So right. Right. That, that is the transition. Before it was stay at home so we can slow the virus and, and level the, the curve. Now it's, it's safer at home than outside because we don't know that much, but that doesn't mean you should just stay at home. But if you go outside, you've got to be responsible. You know, you've, you've got to be able to do what you need to do. And that's why the mask is important. Jake, as a performer, what has this been like for you, uh, Corona? There's been a lot of positives. Like I've had more time to work on songwriting um but uh i mean I, I guess it might be different depending on what you do as a performer like if you're a solo performer it could affect you differently like i guess i'm mostly a role in music you know being a drummer so usually the forces i do are you know with people supporting them playing drums for their um i think it's definitely different for me there are other people who have more like artist careers who are um continuing to live stream their concerts and um it's and that's a cool thing i prefer probably to have their live and in person but it's obviously not to do right now um so i think in some ways it's been kind of good for me to you know dig deeper into my own songwriting and have more time to do that um i definitely i'm i'm fortunate that i also teach music lessons and I've been able to move on. My income did not all go away. I'm super thankful for that. Um, I know some people who are much more dependent on performing for their income and that would be probably a place to be. Um, but there's there's a lot of cool artist grants that are out right now. I know the Club Asim has their pair fund. Um, the record company is a studio in Boston that um, had an artist fund that you could apply for for loss of income. Um, and a bunch of my friends, they, you know, have found, I mean, I've looked into it, but um, I think I'm kind of okay for now. Doing all right with the, the only, um, I still get to help record like the online for the church I go to. So um, I'm still making income in those ways. So um, it's been weird figuring out like, you know, I feel like you place a lot of identity in what you do. And then when you can't do it, all of a sudden it feels very strange, mm. you know, not being able to perform and do concerts is, it's been a little bit of a downer. Um, yeah, been dealing with it, but I'm pretty good. Are you seeing a lot more people becoming engaged with getting music lessons and taking music lessons, maybe restarting or starting for the first time to find their artistic talent in this moment of time to learn how to play an instrument? Yes, yes. I actually um, make a Facebook post like about a month, just, just letting people know that I have openings for students since a lot of canceled. So I, I was saying, hey, if you're interested in, in learning drums, I have a lot of ability now. Um, and I had a couple people reach out to me and have some students as, um, I'm not charging my price because I know that a lot of people are at, you know, different, um, points with 
income depending on their job. Um, but it's it's kind of it's kind of uh, we're meeting each other. Or, you know, they're wanting to learn drums and um, dig deeper into that thing that they didn't have much time for. Um, and now we both have more. Maybe you both have a little bit less income, but we're kind of you know helping each other out on that journey. So it's a cool. Yeah, and and I know that you know Couch Beach has so much material that they're waiting to put out there. Becca, what's going on with with Couch Beach and and how you guys are going to do this? Yeah, so we recorded a bunch of stuff back in January um, with our producer engineer, best friend ever, Joe Raz, um, and. Once this all went down, his studio is in his grandmother's basement and she's 92 years old. So he wasn't able to get back in there for a long time to get any of his equipment. And I think as of like maybe this week, he just got everything back. Um, so hopefully he'll, we'll be releasing some new stuff soon. We have some rough mixes and stuff. So we're just waiting on mastering and some final touches and we'll get to release stuff. Um, we do have a gig with Club Passim on Wednesday. That's a virtual concert they're doing. So that'll be exciting. So how do we get to that? If you visit Club Passim's website, um, you can find where they are streaming uh, the Campfire Festival. So that's what this was supposed to be. They have a, they have twice a year, they have a Campfire Festival once on Memorial Day and then again in the fall day. Um, and it's just an entire weekend of um, a bunch of acts, um, and now it's had to move to being online. So um, you can go on their website or their Facebook page. They've been streaming concerts, and then they'll now be their uh, campfire festival. So and Dr. Jeff, it. bringing it full so, circle, now we get to expose Couch Beach to millions of people now that might not have otherwise gone to the campfire festival, right? Now they can see it streamed live, right? Right. Uh, so look, we, we've got two minutes left, and, and I'm, I'm going to just ask Dan this. And Becker and Jacob, next time you come back. So Dan, you know, we talk about the IM. We haven't spoken about it much tonight, but there are two rules. Small changes have big effects. What small change could you suggest to our listening audience so they can manage a bit more getting through Corona? What small change can they do? Ooh, I would say, and I think it's easy at this time, and it's worked for me, not not by choice. It's not something I consciously did. I just real, it, it's happening to people, I think, is with the slowdown of everything, if you eliminate the noise in your life, like 95% of the noise is not necessary, and, and the 5% of the stuff is is what's so important. And I, I've personally, not business wise, but personally greatly enjoyed this, this, this opportunity, opportunity to focus on that 5% of things that matter. Yeah. So I, I have this great fear actually that things are going to restart and we're going to forget about the 5% that really, really matters. Um, mm. So to me, that's, that's been the huge, a huge benefit. And, and personally, it came at a time when I was, things were very busy and, to be to have the opportunity to reset and realize actually you know what matters has been has been excellent and then the second you control no one you influence everyone you get to choose the kind of influence you want to be dan has what kind of influence do you want to be on our community i don't think that like personally i want to project any influence that it would just like to live a life that makes sense and have people uh, I guess lead by example would be the, the the way to live. I don't think that, you know, personally, I don't think projecting influences of great interest to me. But you certainly are leading by example. I mean, excellence. It's all about community, and that's why I really appreciate everything that you're doing for Marshfield, but but just for everyone. The innovation is fantastic. So, folks, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. And we will be back next week. We've got some other really interesting guests. Tom and Mark, it's always a pleasure. Pleasure's ours. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thank man. you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having Dan, thank you, Becca. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you.